folks, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Danny Postel. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. And it is a distinct honor for me this evening to introduce my good friend, Stephen Kinzer. Before I do that, however, I want to thank um, a couple of co-sponsoring bodies um, who joined forces with our Center for Middle East Studies uh, this evening in bringing uh, Stephen here uh, for this discussion. DU's Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies, appropriately enough, since, as I'll mention in a moment, Stephen, of course, has been a journalist for most of his working life and has been a professor of journalism and international politics for the last several years since retiring from the New York Times. And also the Estlo International Center for, Jun for Journalism and New Media. Is there anyone here in the room tonight from either of those two co-sponsors? My God, now I've outed them as no-shows. That's terrible form. <laughs> That's okay. We're happy to take their money whether they're here or not. I'm joking, of course. Um, in all seriousness, it's um, particularly meaningful for me to partner with um, our colleagues in journalism and media studies on these events, not only because Stephen is both a journalist and a, an author and historian uh, of U.S. foreign policy, but because I myself um, am in fact a leopard in the temple here in academia. I'm actually a member of that same tribe, not nearly, and the kind of elite, at the elite elder level of the tribe that Stephen is, but I too am a journalist, and that's actually how I met Stephen. So first let me say a few things about Stephen, um, the sort of nuts and bolts of Stephen's really quite extraordinary career. Um, it's kind of depressing, actually, to compile a biography like Stevens in preparation for an event like this because it makes you realize how bloody boring your life has been. <clears throat> but it does give you something to aspire to. Um, I have long felt that I want to be Stephen Kinzer when I grow up. Um, the only problem is that I refuse to grow up. If I did grow up, though, um, I would want to be Stephen Kinzer, who is an award-winning foreign correspondent who's covered, and I love this, although... Um, I think some of us may have heard it before. It never gets tiring to say this. Stephen has covered more than 50 countries on five continents. Just think about that for a second. Is Antarctica one of them? That's the one I'm missing. We've got something to look forward to. Um, Stephen, as many of you know, was the New York Times bureau chief. And here's something for you. In Nicaragua, in Berlin, and in Istanbul. That gives you a sense of his extraordinary cosmopolitanism, internationalism, and knowledge of the world. He was also the Latin America correspondent for the Boston Globe. Stephen's many, many books include, and I'll just mention a few of them, in reverse chronological order, starting with the most recent one, which is actually what brought him to Denver on this occasion, although it's not the subject of his talk tonight. His newest book is titled The Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles and their secret world war. I remember an earlier title was going to be We Have Enemies. I wish I could say it in that Kinzerian kind of tone. Um, his penultimate book, which is actually the subject of tonight's talk, is Reset, Iran, Turkey, and America's Future. He's also the author of A Thousand Hills, Rwanda's Rebirth and the Man Who Dreamed It a political biography of Paul Kagame. Overthrow, this is the book for, for which Stephen is perhaps best known, although it's actually tricky to try to pin that down. It depends who you talk to. Um, you talk to Iranians, he's best known for all the Shah's men. Um, but Overthrow is really his kind of, in, in some ways, his mega work of U.S. foreign policy history. Overthrow, America's century of regime change from Hawaii to Iraq, published in 2006. All the Shah's Men, An American Coup, and the Roots of Middle East Terror. I see several faces in this room, in fact, of students in Professor Hashemi's uh, course on modern Iranian history and politics in which that book is being used. How exciting to be able to attend an event with the author of a book you've been studying. 
And Stephen is also the author of Crescent and Star, Turkey Between Two Worlds. Um, there are other books, Bitter Fruit, uh, which is the history of the uh, coup in Guatemala in 1954. In fact, I met Stephen, I'll just personalize it by saying that I met Stephen in the fall of 2003, so exactly a decade ago, when we both happened to be living in Chicago. And although neither of us now lives in Chicago, Stephen's in Boston and I'm here in Denver, when we talk on the phone, it, I noticed that I'm calling from my 312 number to his 708 number, which is from when he lived in Oak Park, just outside of Chicago and taught at Northwestern University. So we still have that Chicago uh, wavelength. And I met Stephen at Northeastern Illinois University, which in November, this time, exactly a decade ago, in November of 2003, the university organized uh, a conference on the 50th anniversary of not only the coup in Iran, but the coup that took place uh, shortly thereafter in Guatemala in 1954. So it was a, a double commemoration. And of course, Stephen had written books on both of those coups and was therefore the keynote speaker at that event. I should also say that when Stephen was teaching at Northwestern University right around that time, 2004, 5, 6, his office was right next to Dr. Nader Hashemis, who um, was doing a postdoc. Um, the two of them were in the political science department, and I used to have a lot of fun visiting Scott Hall in Evanston uh, on Northwestern's campus and hanging out with the two of them. So this is a little bit of a reunion uh, for me and Nader to have Stephen here on campus. Um, it was an honor as well uh, when Nader and I co-edited a book on Iran a few years ago called The People Reloaded the Green Movement and the Struggle for Iran's Future. We included an essay by Stevens. It was actually uh, one of his guardian columns on uh, the legacy of Mohammad Mossadegh um, and the iconography of Mossadegh in the Green Uprising of 2009. Stephen has taught journalism and international affairs, as I mentioned, at Northwestern, but also at Boston University. And he's currently a visiting fellow at Brown University's Watson Institute for International Studies. He is a columnist for The Guardian, has written frequently for The Daily Beast. I see his stuff now on Al Jazeera America, and has been a frequent contributor to that Shangri-La of US publications, the New York Review of Books. Um, let me just give you a, a, a small idea of the influence of Stephen's work and what people have had to say just about his two most recent books. About the brothers, his book on the Dulles brothers. Book list called it a historical critique sure to spark debate. I think that's a nice summary of Stephen's career actually, sure to spark debate. Kirkus says that the book draws the Dulles brothers from the shadows, provoking a reevaluation of their influence and its effects. I like that image, drawing the Dulles brothers from the shadows. How about this for a blurb? John le Carré calls the book a secret history calmly retold, an essential allegory of our times. Evan Thomas calls the book a disturbing, provocative, important book. Stephen Kinzer vividly brings the Dulles brothers, once paragons of American Cold War supremacy, to life and makes a strong case against the dangers of American exceptionalism. And finally, Andrew Basevich at Boston University says that the Dulles brothers is a whale of a story, and Stephen Kinzer tells it with verve, insight, and just the right amount of indignation. Just the right amount. Now, Stephen's penultimate book, Reset, which will be the subject, in a manner of speaking, of tonight's presentation. NPR calls it at once a stern critique of American foreign policy and a concise, colorful, and compelling modern history of Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. Kinzer is a masterful storyteller. His cast of characters leaps off the page. Kirkus calls it an original, unsettling critique and an imaginative solution to the Middle East stalemate. Ambassador Thomas Pickering, former US ambassador to the United Nations, says that Stephen Kinzer's deep knowledge of the Middle East is complemented by his lucid style and new ideas. 
His historical perspective and trenchant analysis make Reset an informative read for experts and newcomers alike. And finally, I think this is my favorite, I'm saving the best for last, Gary Sick of Columbia University, former Carter administration official. In fact, he appears in the film that uh, Dr. Hashimi showed in his Modern Iranian History course yesterday. He was a Carter administration official on the Iran desk. He says, Kinzer elaborates grand ideas in the conversational voice of a storyteller and challenges conventional wisdom in the most reasonable tones. But let the reader beware. He will make you think, and you may never see the region in quite the same way again. That is exactly why we invited Stephen Kinzer to speak on this theme tonight. The book Reset came out during those years when I was lucky to live in Chicago uh, when Stephen did. The book came out, I think, at a very unfortunate time for Stephen and for the book, which is to say it came out in 2010. As you'll soon hear, one of the arguments of the book, and for those of you who were here at noon, you heard Stephen say that one of his arguments is that the United States needs to radically reevaluate its relationship to Iran, to rethink its um, longstanding hostility to that central Middle Eastern country. Um, it was a good idea when he wrote it. It's a good idea now. But the book came out right in the middle of the crackdown on the green movement in Iran, a paroxysm of repression. Iran was more isolated than ever. It wasn't quite the right time. And so when Stephen told me he was coming to Denver uh, on a book tour with the Dulles Brothers book, I said, you know, as much as I'd love to hear the story of the Dulles Brothers, I'd actually like to revisit the reset argument and update it for us. A lot has happened since that unfortunate moment when the book first came out, when it was sort of stillborn, despite these wonderful blurbs and reviews. The fact is that the book didn't get nearly the reception it should have. I believe that the new events of the last few months have given Reset a new lease on life, a second wind, and that's why I wanted Stephen to discuss it tonight. A lot has happened. And I think this is a Kinzerian moment. And so it's very exciting for me personally and for our Center for Middle East Studies to welcome, I think, really one of the great thinkers and writers of our time, Stephen Kinzer. Do you have anything else to say? Uh, that's really a wonderful introduction. I'm a uh, senior leopard, and uh, I'm... <laughs> I'll have, to, I'll have to assimilate some of that, what that means. Um, it's great to be back here for uh, the second time this year and also the second time today. Um, it's actually true. This is an interesting situation for me that this book uh, came out some time ago. And uh, suddenly, there's a, there really is a new wind. I even had a, an email from the uh, publisher who published this book uh, in Britain. And he said to me, uh, suddenly this is all seeming to become real. Wouldn't you like to come back and do another tour? Last time I was there, I had, was interviewed by David Frost. Maybe we can uh, jack it up a little higher. And uh, it, it might seem a little bit more reasonable now. Uh, let me just start by making this observation. Uh, when we look at the world, I think we tend to assume that the pieces on the global chessboard are more or less firmly in place. In many cases, I think we sense that they're nailed down. This was a, an idea that we had during the Cold War. I mean, everybody knew that the Soviet Union was always going to exist. Everyone knew that the Cold War paradigm would go on forever. Um, everyone knew that uh, we would have certain countries that would be our enemies forever, others that would be our friends. But actually, the world isn't like that. Uh, the pieces on the global chessboard can be moved around. They're not nailed down. So just this realization alone should be enough to let us try to reimagine how the world might look, uh, how we could redesign it if we, if we wanted to. Uh, I come down in the foreign policy theory field as a, something like a hyper-realist. I'm, I'm believing that interest National interest is really uh, the only reliable guide for 
the behavior of nations. Now, sometimes it's in your national interest to cooperate with other countries and to do things in a multilateral way. But in the end, countries always come back to their interests. And the one thing that gets in the way of countries pursuing their interests is emotion. Emotion is always the enemy of wise statesmanship. And emotion has clouded our foreign policy, particularly in recent years. It's uh, it prevented us from being able to see more clearly our interests and the interests of our, our friends and our rivals. Uh, it's not a good idea to try to push other countries to pursue your interests. We, we've done this for a long time, particularly in the Middle East. We want the countries that we consider allies to promote our interests. In the long run, this never works. Countries want to pursue their own interests. The United States should never subcontract its foreign policy to another country. And the countries in the Middle East should not subcontract their foreign policy to us either. There will be times when we can work in concert with countries, and sometimes there will be countries with whom we can work quite closely over a long period of time on a whole variety of issues. But in the end, we need to choose our partners carefully. And the way to assess a valued partner over a long period of time is to look at our own interests and to look at the interests of the countries that we're considering as partners. So this was the general idea that led me to, uh, to consider this realignment that I talk about in, in this book, Reset. Uh, I lived in, in Istanbul for several years and followed closely events in that part of the world. And I became quite puzzled at some of the ways the United States had approached that region. Uh, our traditional two close allies in that part of the world have been Israel and Saudi Arabia. Uh, two countries that we've kept at a little bit of an arm's length have been Turkey and Iran. Uh, I would say we've kept Turkey at a half an arm's length and we've kept Iran at about two arm's lengths, at least in the last 34 years. Uh, but even after decades pass, when emotion dominates foreign policy, interests always emerge again. So let me talk a little bit about the history of our relationships with these four countries, our two close friends and two other countries that I think we really have some very close and intriguing similarities with. Uh, my favorite of the four in terms of the uh, evolution of the relationship is Saudi Arabia, or in terms of the origin of the relationship, it's, it's Saudi Arabia. So uh, you all remember that Franklin Roosevelt attended the Yalta Conference at the end of World War II in the Crimea. Uh, but it was never known at the time that Franklin Roosevelt, when he got on his warship to come home, did not come straight home. He made a stop. This was never publicized. Um, and he traveled to the Great Salt Lake in the, uh, in the Suez Canal, and there he waited for a guest. And his guest was the king of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the United States was entering into a period when two things were changing. First of all, we understood that oil was going to be the center of our economy, a key part of our economy. Uh, and the other thing that was changing was the United States was assuming a hegemonic role in the Middle East that had previously been uh, assumed by Britain and to a lesser degree by France and to a somewhat even lesser degree by Russia. The old colonial powers were finished, and we were moving in to fill that gap. So uh, the king of Saudi Arabia set out on a pilgrimage to Mecca, but when he was almost there, he told his group, we're not going to Mecca. We're going to Jeddah, which is the port city. At Jeddah, he got on a boat. Now, the only, there were only four people in Saudi Arabia that knew about this plan, the king, the foreign minister, the American ambassador, and the code clerk in the American embassy. Uh, so they get on this boat, and of course uh, the king started bringing uh, several dows full of vegetables and full of sheep, so that he would have something to eat. Uh, the our American ambassador, our, our, the, the translator for Franklin Roosevelt was a very interesting guy named Eddie, who had been the uh, U.S. ambassador to Egypt. He'd grown up in Egypt. Uh, he spoke fluent Arabic. Uh, and he explained, he tried to explain the concept of refrigeration 
uh, to the Saudi king and tell him, you don't need to bring the vegetables. You know, we have vegetables and we can, we can serve you there. Um, and the king was able to, gave in on that, but he insisted on bringing the sheep. Sure enough, uh, they, I believe this was probably the only time in history that uh, sheep were ritually slaughtered on the deck of a US naval vessel. Um, it must have been quite a scene. He had a series of Nubian slaves with him who were cooking coffee in the gunwales, and uh, he had an astrologer to figure out where Mecca was. It must have been a very interesting cross-cultural mix. Um, he finally arrived on the warship where uh, Franklin Roosevelt was waiting, um, and Roosevelt received him very warmly. He gave him a gift, actually. Uh, they, the first thing they did, and you know, now that I'm getting older, I can really appreciate this. They bonded by talking about one thing they have in common. That's one of the things that you normally do when you meet someone. You find one thing you really have in common. They start talking about their ailments. Ah, my back, my legs, I can't do this, I feel terrible. They realized they had a lot of the same problems. Their legs weren't working. And Franklin Roosevelt, of course, was in a wheelchair. He always carried an extra wheelchair for emergencies, and he gave this to uh, the Saudi king as a gift. Uh, the Saudi king was actually too big. He couldn't fit into it, but he still thought this was a great gift, and he, he considered it one of the, the best symbols of American friendship that he ever received. Uh, so they had some long conversations. There was actually another very interesting footnote on this. Uh, the king was very impressed with uh, a lot of what he saw. Uh, they showed him a movie about the workings of an American battleship, which he found endlessly fascinating. Um, he also became a great addict of ice cream and apple pie and ordered apples planted in Saudi Arabia after uh, realizing how tasty apple pie was. I never found the footnote of that, but I've never noticed that the Saudi apples really made it onto the world market. Uh, but the, the, the real interesting footnote is that uh, William Eddy, the translator, uh, actually wrote an, uh, a memoir, a little article once, just for his own use, which later became public, although I don't think many people have read it, about this episode. And he said he was standing on the ship during one of the Roosevelt, uh, during one of the breaks in the meetings, and one of the Saudi princes came up to him and asked him if he would prefer to be murdered immediately or would he like to be uh, cut slowly into small pieces. So he asked, uh, what, uh, what leads you to ask me such a question. Well, the prince said that he had learned that uh, movies were being shown to the American sailors below deck, and uh, no, he was not invited. The, this king had already announced after seeing the movie about the battleship, I do not think movies should ever be shown in Saudi Arabia. We're just not ready for it. So uh, Eddie was terrified and said that he couldn't possibly allow any of the Saudis to go down and watch a movie because if the king found out, that would be the end of the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States. And so the prince then asked uh, Eddie uh, how interested he would be in having his children grow up as orphans. <laughs> Finally, Eddie uh, agreed on the condition that the king never found out. In fact, as far as we know, the king never did. And uh, the prince came down, and the movie they were showing was uh, a Lucille Ball movie in which she gets... Uh, loose in a men's dormitory and has many of her outer garments torn off as she runs around among all these men. Um, news of this orgy apparently never reached the king, so everything was okay, but that was a, it's a very interesting moment because it shows you that the absolute foundation of Saudi Arabia is hypocrisy. Uh, the princes watch the movies, but they don't let anyone in Saudi Arabia watch them. And it goes a lot further than that. Um, the, I'll get back to that in a moment, but I'll finish the story about Roosevelt. So Franklin Roosevelt and the Saudi king essentially reached an agreement. Um, the king agreed that the United States would have the right to exploit oil in Saudi Arabia, and he wasn't going to go to any other country. So it wasn't going to be the British, wasn't going to be the French, it would be the Americans. In fact, later on, he was asked by an American journalist, why did you choose us? Why did you decide that the U.S. should be your partner? And he had a great answer. He said, you are very far away. <laughs> uh, so Roosevelt promised the Saudis, first of all, uh, that we would never invade or politically try to destabilize or intervene in Saudi Arabia, and secondly, that we would never do anything in the Middle East, including having to do with the possible recognition of a Jewish state, unless we consulted first with Saudi Arabia. Um, unfortunately, Franklin Roosevelt died shortly thereafter, and uh, I think those, those pledges probably died with him. 
Uh, now, Saudi Arabia went on to build a truly unique state. It's not just that it's a country named after the, a family um, and very much the property of that family, but uh, it's a state that's founded on, on a bizarre deal that I think symbolizes the hypocrisy to which I referred earlier. And the deal essentially was and is this. This is the fundamental basis of the Saudi regime from the beginning to today. Uh, there are two pillars of Saudi Arabia, support of the United States and support of the Wahhabi clergy inside Saudi Arabia. This was never a relationship that could sustain itself indefinitely. It was going to crash at some point because the interests of the United States and the interests of the Wahhabi clergy are totally at odds. Here was the deal. Of course, the Wahhabi clergy, this is the most, I would say, militant or fundamentalist of the principal sects of uh, Sunni Islam. Uh, the, the Wahhabi clergy naturally does not like the fact that Saudi Arabia is allied with the greatest Christian power in the world. Uh, they don't like the lifestyle of the thousands of Saudi princes who love to spend their millions in the casinos in France and import uh, companions from Europe and uh, have all sorts of aspects of their lives that uh, are not pleasant for strictly believing Muslims. Um, and in addition, uh, the Wahhabi clergy is dedicated especially to trying to overthrow regimes like that. So here was the deal. Uh, do not criticize us for our lifestyles. Do not criticize us for our relations with the Americans or the West. Um, and do not foment any opposition to us. In exchange for this, we will give you unlimited sums of money, which we will earn from the United States, from our oil sales. And with this money, you can go all around the world and set up mosques and madrasas where you can teach whole generations of young boys to chant the Quran and hate America. And you can foment rebellion against infidels, including Muslim regimes, uh, that you don't consider fundamentalist enough. But don't do it here. So this is the fundamental deal on which Saudi Arabia is based. And it, I think maybe the first time that, that, uh, that the unsustainability of that deal became clear was on September 11th. Because the September 11th hijackers were products of this Wahhabi influence. And they followed the Wahhabi clergy and the Wahhabi clergy's message to its logical conclusion. And they did this essentially with our money. We financed our own assassins. Right now, uh, I think Saudi Arabia is in a, a delicate situation, which is something we haven't seen for a long time. Uh, and the United States, I think, is, is also in a somewhat different situation. You could argue that despite all of these negative aspects of the Saudi regime, we needed them during the Cold War for strategic reasons and because they were giving us oil. But neither of those things is true anymore. So that's a fundamental change in the U.S.-Saudi relationship. In addition, uh, I sense that now there is more potential instability in Saudi Arabia than at any time since the regime was founded. Uh, it's not just that women want to drive. The only country in the world, by the way, where, of course, women can't drive, and uh, that's just a symbol for all the restrictions on women in Saudi Arabia. Another reason why Saudi Arabia makes an odd ally, because one of the reasons, one of the criteria you should use in choosing your allies is countries whose societies are a little bit like yours. Saudi Arabia society is nothing like ours. Um, but the very interesting episode happened just a couple of weeks ago. Many of you are familiar with this. So Saudi Arabia campaigned intensely for a seat on the UN Security Council. They had a whole group of diplomats, like two dozen diplomats, training at Columbia University for two years to carry on the extra responsibilities that go with being a Security Council member. And finally, they won. They got elected to the Security Council. And about six hours later, in the middle of the night, we got a message out of Riyadh saying, we don't want the Security Council seat. 
This has never happened in the history of the UN. The only person who could have made that decision is the king. I believe we're uh, looking, because of this, uh, at a potential succession crisis. The king is now about 90 years old. Um, I believe there must be strong groups among the princes. There are 6,000 princes. Uh, so there must be a small, a strong group that wants Saudi Arabia to change and evolve and become more like the rest of the world, and another strong group that doesn't want that. Those groups are going to clash. And when the king dies, I think we're going to see something we've never seen in Saudi Arabia before. So that's the beginning and the, of the U.S.-Saudi relationship and where we stand now. Saudi Arabia is very upset with the United States right now. Uh, they haven't broken the alliance, nor have we. Uh, but they don't like the way we are looking around the region and not uh, following this idea that Saudi Arabia and the United States should be intimate friends forever. At the same time, we built up a strong relationship with Israel. But the Israeli relationship also had a very odd beginning. Because in the first years of the state of Israel, in the late 40s and through much of the 1950s, or certainly half of the 1950s, we were not close allies of Israel. Actually, Israel's best friend was the Soviet Union. Uh, and part of the reason for that was that the original settlers of Israel were essentially socialists from Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, they, that's where the kibbutz idea came from. And they liked the idea of socialism. And they were quite friendly with the Soviets. Uh, but that changed, of course, during the course of the 1950s. And part of the reason had to do with actually an episode that the Dulles brothers were involved with in Egypt. So uh, Arab nationalism emerged during the 1950s. And of course, Nasser in Egypt was the light figure, the principal figure of Arab nationalism. Uh, now, it was the fervent desire of Secretary of State John Foster Dulles to keep Soviet influence out of every part of the world, and in particular, to keep Soviet influence out of the Middle East. And once the United States had effectively seduced Israel away from the Soviets, Egypt became uh, a central interest for the Dulles brothers. They thought they could bring Nasser over to be an ally of the United States, which was never possible because Arab nationalism has as its central principle avoiding alliances with outside powers. Nonetheless, the Dulles brothers thought they could do this. Um, but because Nasser was misbehaving and essentially deciding he wanted to be a nationalist and promote Egypt's interests, not America's interests, uh, John Foster Dulles told the... Uh, told the uh, Egyptian ambassador in Washington that if Nasser didn't behave, the United States was going to withdraw its offer to finance the great Egyptian project, the Aswan Dam. Uh, and the ambassador replied, please don't tell me you're going to stop the loan, because I have the Soviet offer right here in my pocket. And Foster Dulles said, great, the loan offer is withdrawn. You can go wherever you want, never believing that this was sincere. Nasser was furious. Americans, may you choke on your fury. That was his line. He immediately called the Soviets, and the next thing you know, Egypt was a Soviet ally. Not just friends, but Egypt was receiving huge amounts of Soviet military hardware and Soviet soldiers. There were MiGs. There were huge numbers of Soviet tanks. So what it means is that Soviet influence came into the Middle East for the first time, not because they invaded a country, not because they subverted a weak political system, but at the open invitation of a popular leader who made this decision because he was rejected by the Americans, who couldn't accept the fact that he would remain neutral. Saudi Arabia didn't remain neutral. They became our intimate friends. And we're happy to receive our billions on one condition. Um, and this was something that became especially important when oil prices began to skyrocket. And actually, this deal was had to do a lot with Henry Kissinger, a very clever global strategist. Essentially, his message to the Saudis and also to the Iranians under the Shah in those days was, look, we're giving you hundreds of billions of dollars, and we can't sustain this in our economy. So we're happy to give you this money, and we know you're going to send some of it to the Wahhabi clergy, uh, but you've got to give a lot of it back to us. You've got to buy American products. So what American products are there that cost hundreds of billions of dollars that Saudi Arabia wants? Weapons. They became, Saudi Arabia, along with Iran, became the principal buyers of American weaponry. During this time, the United States was 
looking around the world for countries that it could use as places from which, platforms from which it could project regional influence. It was the American strategy that in every part of the world, we needed one big country that would be our ally and our base. So we had, for example, the Congo in Africa, uh, Indonesia under Suharto for East Asia, and it was Iran for uh, the Middle East. Under the Shah, uh, the United States had great relations with Iran. In fact, in his memoir, Henry Kissinger describes Iran as that rarest of creatures, the unconditional ally. That's the kind of ally we like. And the Shah thrived, the U.S.-Iran relationship thrived because the Shah was willing to pursue American interests rather than pursuing Iranian interests. Unfortunately, at the very end, the Iranian people finally got fed up with this. And not surprisingly, they decided they'd like a regime that pursued Iranian interests. That's why they overthrew the Shah. Unfortunately, they didn't get the kind of regime they wanted. But that was the end of our intimate friendship with Iran. And that was the beginning of the emotion that still hangs over this relationship. We have never forgiven or forgotten the overthrow of the Shah, the hostage crisis that followed, uh, and then the very intense and sometimes quite violent ways that uh, Iran has sought to undermine American influence all over the Middle East and beyond. Now, the, uh, the fourth piece of this, uh, of course, is Turkey. And Turkey has, in so many ways, a, a parallel development with Iran over the last 100 years. Uh, they both developed constitutions very early, uh, uh, around the time of the, around 1900, Tur Turkey a little bit before, Iran a little bit afterward. Uh, the emergence of Ataturk paralleled the emergence uh, in, in Turkey, paralleled the uh, rising of Reza Shah in uh, Iran, both uh, modernizing dictators. Uh, and the United States slowly developed uh, a friendship with Turkey, and then we invited Turkey to join NATO uh, for a very important reason, which was it was in our interest. Um, Turkey uh, was bordering on the Soviet Union and we needed a NATO member that boarded directly on, on the Soviet Union. Uh, now, during this period, that was all during the Cold War, Turkey was not an important country. Turkey really had no foreign policy. Its only foreign policy was, we do what NATO wants. And Turkey was not important because Turkey's way out on the edge of everything. It's, it wasn't in Europe, it's not in, in the Middle East. It's, it's way out on the margins. But with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, suddenly we woke up and found that Turkey was not on the edges anymore. Turkey was right in the center of the world, which is where that piece of geography has been ever since the Trojan War. So Turkey suddenly became much more important. And then Turkey took a number of democratization steps, and Turkey became, in some ways, a very intriguing blend of uh, Islamic belief and Western democracy. So this brings me to today and our situation as we look at the Middle East. First of all, my general view of where we are now in the Middle East is that our long decades of hegemony in that part of the world didn't work out well for us. You could argue, I'm not sure I would accept the argument, but there's a, a reasonable argument that we had to do that during the Cold War. But we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, the end of the Cold War allows us to see the region a little bit more clearly. First of all, Turkey is emerging as a powerhouse in that part of the world, economically and to a certain degree politically. You, that hasn't happened in Iran yet, but it will. Well, the first thing that I do when I get to a country uh, that I've never been to before is I ask myself, why is this country like this? So how did this country get to be rich and powerful, or why is this country poor and miserable? Uh, when I got to Iran, uh, the first thing that struck me was the, the tremendous gap between what Iran should be and what Iran is. So Iran is, a, is the big country right in the middle of the Middle East. You can't miss it if you look at a map of the Middle East. 
And Iran has a huge history. It was the first empire in the world, of course, the Persian Empire. Its culture is immeasurably rich. But yet, Iran is poor and isolated and unhappy. Uh, when I started asking Iranians why this was, they all told me, well, we had a democracy here until, thanks very much, you came over here in 1953 and, and destroyed it for us. I didn't, I was a little bit taken aback by that because I hadn't really understood all that. That was what led me to write that book, All the Shah's Men. Uh, nonetheless, this anomaly, this huge divide between what Iran should be and what Iran is, can't continue. It's, it's not, uh, it's not realistic in terms of geopolitics. And I think right now we're seeing some very intriguing moves uh, that might be the beginning of Iran returning to the position that it should be in. Now, also, also remember that Turkey and Iran are the two big non-Arab countries in the Muslim Middle East. And that is not an insignificant factor. These are two countries that have uh, rich histories and considerable self-confidence. And I would say another thing they have in common is that they're, how can I put this in a gentle way? Let's say their love for Arabs has limits. So as I look around this, and, and so let's look at where we are now. Uh, Saudi Arabia is entering into an unstable period. And the essential hypocrisy of Saudi society is becoming more and more apparent. Saudi Arabia is not a good long-term ally for us. First of all, it's not a society that has anything in common with ours. And secondly, Saudi Arabia's interests are not our interests. I'm all for Saudi Arabia pursuing its interests. Let it do that. But let's not us promote Saudi interests. Let's promote our interests. Uh, so I think that the Saudi fear that uh, the United States might be loosening our friendship with Riyadh is actually a good thing. Uh, I hope it's justified. Uh, I don't want to turn Saudi Arabia into an enemy uh, or even a rival. I think it can make a partner in certain circumstances. But what's good for Saudi Arabia is bad for us in many ways. And I think it's time we, we start to realize that. Um, I still remember when I covered Central Asia. And this was, what would this have been like in the late 1990s? I would show up in Kyrgyzstan or Uzbekistan in remote areas where people were living quite poorly. And there'd be a spectacular new mosque with a big school and a huge dome that was bigger than practically all the other buildings in the village put together. And I'd say, where did this come from? And they'd say, oh, just got here two years ago. The generous Saudis came over here, and they built this for us. And not only that, they're so nice, they're sending us the teachers to teach us how to understand the Quran. This was going on all over Saudi Arabia, and it still is. And Saudi Arabia cannot stop doing this, because if they stop, the Wahhabi clergy will say, OK, we, you broke the deal. We'll break the deal, too. And we're going to point out to the people in this country who you re rulers really are. The Saudi, the Saud family cannot take that. So Saudi Arabia has to do what it has to do. But we also should do what we have to do. Um, Israel is also pursuing its, what it perceives to be its own interests. I find it troubling, however, uh, the way that Israel defines its interests. I, I fear that Israel has come to the conclusion that it can maintain its security indefinitely by military means alone. It, I believe there's a, a strong strain in Israeli security policy that says it doesn't matter if we have a billion people around us who hate us. As long as we have enough planes and enough bombs and a nuclear program and a chemical weapons program, we can take care of all those problems. I find that dangerous over the long run. Um, and I think it promotes feelings in the world, including far beyond the Middle East, that in the long run are very dangerous for Israel. Now, again, I want to say something about Israel that I would also say about Saudi Arabia. If Israel perceives its interests in a certain way, and the society of Israel is changing in ways that are forcing the government to redefine its, its interests, then that's a decision Israel has to make. Uh, 
I, I don't think it's right to ex demand that Israel follow what's in the U.S. interest, but I also don't think it's right that it should go the other way either. Let Israel pursue the policies that it has to pursue, and let Saudi Arabia do the same thing. But the United States should not be promoting those policies if it believes they're not good for the United States. Now let's start, turn to Turkey and Iran. Um, Turkey has, in the last couple of years, uh, veered away from what I consider to be a stable and wise foreign policy that it followed for the last 10 years or so. Nonetheless, I still feel that Turkey can be a, a stabilizing factor, not the least because of its example. The, the ruling party in Turkey is unique in the Muslim world in this way. It is the most Islamic, the most religious party in the country, and it's also the most pro-Western and pro-capitalist party in the country. This does not exist in any other country. And it has to do with a peculiar series of circumstances. Uh, millions of Turks went to live in Europe. Uh, they understood European capitalism uh, and a little bit about the European social idea. They came back to Turkey and uh, they decided they wanted to build uh, a society that would respect their Muslim religious beliefs, but would also be capitalist oriented and uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, this is a great example for the rest of the Islamic world. And this is the way uh, to, to change the Islamic world, not to bomb it, not to occupy it, but to show that there's another way, that you don't have to abandon Islam to become uh, an, a re stable economy based on modern economic principles and an open society based on a certain measure of democracy. They don't clash. So Turkey is, is providing an example that is very good for us to have projected. And we can't project that image ourselves, nor can any other Islamic country. We would love to have another one in the Middle East that would do that, but we don't have one. So the example of Turkey is very important for us. In fact, in my last interview with the president of Turkey, Abdullah Gul, he told me the greatest thing we're doing in the Middle East is that we just sit here and give visas to people to come and visit. And they do. They come for the millions. And then they've started ab abolishing visa requirements. If you live in Iran, for example, you can just come across the border. Very few countries will allow Iranians in with no visa. Turkey is one of them. And so many Iranians uh, come to Turkey. They take ideas with them. The uh, iconic victim of the Green Movement protests, Neda, had spent months in Turkey. She assimilated, I think, in Turkey some of these ideas that uh, we should be able to be free. We should be able to insist on our rights. And we can still be Muslims while being Democrats. This is the great example of Turkey. Now let's turn to Iran, which in some ways is the most fascinating country in that part of the world. Uh, I think that uh, our overtures to Iran are positive and long overdue. Over the last 30 years, there have been times when one side was ready to talk, the other side never was. It now seems like finally we may have, uh, we may have reached this point when both sides are willing to talk. Uh, there's a tremendous overhang of mistrust on both sides. Uh, we have a very different historical narrative. Actually, the America and the United, uh, the United States and Iran have what I would call parallel historical narratives that go on and on and on, but they never cross. They never approach each other. They're, they're always separate. And the essence of the American narrative is the beginning of U.S.-Iran relations and the end of U.S.-Iran relations was the hostage crisis. That defines everything. But for the Iranians, things are very different. They would say, well, the hostage crisis was one blip and one unfortunate thing among a lot of unfortunate things that have happened here. But the real defining moment was when we lost our democracy, thanks to your coup, in 1953. I've actually thought that a great challenge, in fact, this might be a future column for me. Let me make a note. Um, the, there, some people have asked, shouldn't the United States apologize explicitly for the coup? Uh, what I would like to see is a statement drafted by both sides in which both sides would, if not apologize, acknowledge the pain and the injustice that they have visited on the other side. Let us both acknowledge that we've wronged each other. I think there's plenty to apologize for on both sides, but rather than an apology, let's use a recognition of the past and our, both of our misdeeds as a foundation for the future. 
Uh, I hope that our talks with Iran will not begin and end on the nuclear issue. I guess they have to start on the nuclear issue, but there are so many areas in which the United States and Iran can cooperate. And I'd go further than that, and this is a statement that I think is jarring for Americans based on what we've been told and what we've heard for so long, and that is that the United States and Iran have many long-term security interests in common. We actually have more interests in common with Iran than with almost any other country in that region. Uh, what do I mean by that, for example? First of all, Iran has a tremendous ability to help stabilize Afghanistan. Don't forget that the entire western third of Afghanistan used to be part of Iran until Iran lost a war in the 19th century. They speak the same language. Uh, there's very strong ties there. Uh, Iran also has tremendous ability to help stabilize Iraq. And what we've seen in the last months in Iraq is truly horrific as we see this sectarian uh, struggle spiraling kind of out of control. Now, why doesn't Iran do that now? Well, Iran, I think, is traditionally afraid that if it stabilizes, helps stabilize Iraq and helps stabilize Afghanistan, those will then become the basis from which the U.S. will attack Iran uh, overtly or covertly. And it's not in Iran's interest at the moment to cooperate with the United States. But that could change with a mutual agreement. And we are desperate to try to assure that when we leave Afghanistan, Afghanistan does not spiral down into a truly horrific war. And we would love to try to calm the sectarian strife in Iraq. Iran also has an ability to participate in solving the horrific crisis that's now enveloping Syria. Uh, we're now reading in the newspapers about all the troubles that uh, the United Nations mediator is having in convening a peace conference about Syria. Here's one of the main reasons that there hasn't been a peace conference, why the countries can't get together. Many of the participants insist that we can't have this conference without Iran. It's got to be a regional conference, and Iran is right there. They're a huge neighbor, biggest neighbor of uh, Syria. They have ties there. But the United States doesn't want Iran at the table. Essentially, what we've said is, much as we hate the horror that is happening in Syria, it would be even worse to sit down at a table with Iran. This is a terrible miscalculation, particularly when you see the horror that is descending onto Syria. It should be a push for us to do everything we can to calm that situation down. Uh, Iran has a tremendous drug problem. Huge. And this is just something that's emerged in the last 10 years. Iran always used to be on the pipeline of drugs from Afghanistan to Europe, but not so much leaked out in Iran. It was just transit. But that's not true anymore. Now heroin addiction is a plague in Iran. Iran is desperate to do something to fix Af the Afghan drug trade, to, to eliminate or control the poppy growing business in Afghanistan because it's killing their country. The United States is eager to do this too. That would be a great project on which to build cooperation. And then most important, Iran is the bitter enemy of radical Sunni movements like the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. They were against the Taliban when we were still friends with the Taliban. And a Taliban delegation was visiting Texas and walking through Walmart buying toothpaste. They were warning us, those are not your friends. And of course, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda want to kill every Shiite. So Iran has a very good reason to be militantly anti-Al-Qaeda. Saudi Arabia is the biggest international funder of jihadist groups like Al-Qaeda. So where's our real interest? So this has led me to this general conclusion that as we look at ways that we might move around the pieces on this global chessboard, maybe it's a moment when we should realize that Israel and Saudi Arabia are pursuing policies that may or may not be wise for them. Those are policies they've decided to pursue, and it's not up to us to try to force countries to do things our way. And we've never even tried to uh, pressure Saudi Arabia in any serious way. Um, and we've done a moderate uh, 
uh, we made moderate efforts with Israel, but for political reasons, we're really not able to put much pressure on Israel. But I don't, I don't find that a problem. I don't mind that Israel be, behaves the way Israel wants. Countries should pursue their own interests. But the United States does not need to embrace the interests of those countries. Meanwhile, Turkey and Iran, over the long run, are better partners for the United States. Um, the democratic consciousness in Turkey and in Iran is huge. Uh, in, uh, in Turkey, a democratically oriented population has produced a democratic government. That has not happened in Iran. Nonetheless, the raw material is there. It's what the Iranian people want. And you can't say that about Saudi Arabia or almost any other country in that part of the world, that parliamentary style democracy is really what they want. But that is true in Iran. Uh, and as a footnote, the Iranian population is undoubtedly the most pro-American population in the whole world. It's truly, it's embarrassing to see how much the Iranians idealize the United States. This pro-American sentiment in Iran is a huge strategic asset for us because we don't have that in very many countries. We should not do anything that will weaken that asset. So I would like to see us uh, work more closely with Turkey, and I hope I think I think Turkey's now beginning to um, refine its strategy towards Syria in ways that I think will be good for the United States. Uh, I hope that the uh, Iran American uh, talks, which are now still in a very tentative stage, will become substantive and will expand beyond uh, the nuclear file. And I hope that the United States has the courage to realize that the situation that led us to create our web of alliances in the Middle East doesn't exist anymore. The situation has changed. Um, you know, uh, I remember a great line from the president of Pakistan in those days, Pervez Musharraf, when he was asked uh, about his change in attitude toward the Taliban. So uh, right after September 11th, uh, Musharraf was against any American attack on the Taliban. And he tried to get the Taliban to surrender. He wanted to try to negotiate something, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't go along. And then Musharraf announced, OK, he's OK. Let, let the Americans bomb Afghanistan and bomb the Taliban. And he was asked, why did you change your mind? And he said, policies are made in accordance with environments. When the environment changes, the policy changes. We're in that situation now. Our environment has changed. So let's look around and see how we should change. I think that's my, my biggest message. So my, my, the message of my book is, let's consider the prospects over the long term of a closer relationship with Iran and a closer relationship with Turkey and less close relations with Saudi Arabia and Israel. But I have a bigger point than that. That's a debatable uh, scenario. I can see a lot of people might see flaws in that and they want to do it some different way. That's OK. I think that's a great debate to have. I don't present this as the absolute only way for the United States to rearrange its relationships in the Middle East. But my bigger point is, let's not be bound by arrangements and relationships and approaches to the world that were set when the world was completely different. Let's liberate ourselves from this slavish uh, f uh, adherence to outmoded policies Let's open our minds to other possibilities and realize that in the long run, when we pursue our own interests, we're doing something that is much better than subcontracting our foreign policy out. Um, you know, I used to live in Turkey, and the, uh, every spring the Turkish Air Force would go out and bomb uh, Kurdish rebel uh, bases in northern Iraq. Now, you're not supposed to bomb other countries. And uh, when the Turkish government was asked, why did you do this uh, by their own people and by other countries, they had a very simple answer. It's in Turkey's interest to do it. Who's going to act in Turkey's interest other than Turkey? That's a pretty convincing argument. And this argument can be used for all kinds of things. When I was covering Rwanda, I began to realize what a hor horrible role France had played in not only in Rwanda, but in much of Africa. And uh, when the French are asked about this, I think they've changed their mind now, but traditionally their explanation was, c'est pour la France. It's good for us. Who's going to be for France if not us? So I'm all for the United States pursuing the interests of the United States. But here's the caveat. Let's 
do what's really in our long-term interest. Let's stop and think what's in our long-term interest. And let's not take steps that make us feel good for a few minutes, but actually wind up undermining our own security over the long run. We shouldn't be ashamed or embarrassed about this. We need partners in the world. I think one thing we've learned over our hegemonic period in the Middle East is we really don't understand the Middle East very well. We need some translators. In my view, Turkey and Iran would be the best translators because their societies look like ours and their long-term interests are parallel to ours. So that's a brave new world to which I look forward. Thank you very much. Looks like he has a question back there. You might have two questions. <laughs> Um, thank you, Stephen, for that uh, enormously stimulating and provocative um, tour de force. I imagine that there are some questions here, although it's interesting. There's usually a pause, of, except when Keenan is in the audience. Uh, That's what it's I usually... want to do when I go to Washington. I want to, see this map? I want to bring this to my congressman, and I want to say, where is Iran? <laughs> because let me tell you, Iran, in the minds of most members of Congress, is not a geographical place. It's a construct. It's an idea, a concept. And I hate this. And I have a modest proposal that members of Congress should be forbidden from advocating the occupation or bombing or attack on any country that they cannot find on a map. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, here's my modest proposal for the American Congress. Not so long ago, I was watching TV, and I saw that uh, they were, there was a report on a NASCAR race, and they were interviewing the winner. And the NASCAR driver is wearing the uniform, those jackets that all the NASCAR drivers wear. So it's a leather jacket, and it's got all these patches, and it's, uh, all, those are all the people that pay for their team. It says Mobile, Toyota, all the Haveline. I want every member of Congress to have to wear a jacket like that. So it says Monsanto, Goldman Sachs. It's got all their sponsors. So at least we would know who owns them. A modest proposal. OK, I interrupted you. Please, go ahead. You're, you no, know, please, go ahead. You've got, You've got more modest proposals. Yes, God, there I'm, are so many. I'm qualifying myself for a Guantanamo visit. <laughs> you have a journalist visa. Keenan. I'm really sympathetic to the argument, but turning to Turkey and Iran, if you ask uh, Arabs, I studied in Cairo and Lebanon, you know, uh, who should our interlocutors in the Middle East be? They're not going to tell you the Turks and the Iranians. And some would say they're not even in the Middle East. Well, I think uh, Iran is in the Middle East. Turkey, not necessarily. I was I was once at a party in Turkey when uh, one I heard I was in a conversation and one guy. Was a, one Turkish guy was asking an American, so uh, are you visiting here? Yes, I'm doing some work here. What do you do? And he says, well, I'm a Middle East scholar. And the guy says, so what are you doing in Turkey? <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. Um, the, uh, in some ways, the Ottoman period uh, was quite positive, but it didn't end so well. And certainly there's an overhang of bad memories in some quarters. But I don't, I don't need an interlocutor for the Arab world. You know. I think it's time for the United States to try to loosen its hegemonic ambitions in the Middle East. And one of the things that this means is, let's let the countries in the Middle East grow up. Let them try to resolve their own problems. Let's not try to have an idea of who should be in charge of every country and which country should be where and on what foreign policy decisions. You know, countries have to go through bad periods. Christianity kept Europe in the Dark Ages for a thousand years. We had to go through that, otherwise there wouldn't have been the Enlightenment. We realized that we don't want that. Now, it's, I don't think it's going to take a thousand years in the Arab world, but it might take 30 years. They, the, the fact that they're going to go through bad periods, where they're going to go through anarchy, they may choose Islamic regimes, but when you see what's happened in Iran, I tell you, you're not going to find a more secular-oriented population in the Middle East than Iran. That shows you when you have a heavy religious government, you get a strong secular population. We're the opposite in the United States. Very secular government, heavily religious population. Uh, so 
I don't think it's necessary for the United States when it sees a problem in an Arab country or it sees an Arab country, quote, going bad, uh, that the U.S. has to decide what to do about it. You know, one thing I've learned in covering uh, interventions and, uh, and uh, conflicts over the years is that gratitude has a really short shelf life. Uh, very quickly after an intervening power arrives, whether it's physically present or it's just promoting and supporting a government that's in power, uh, that intervening power becomes blamed for everything wrong in the country, including things that were already wrong before it even arrived. And I tell you, the ones who are the most, the loudest in begging you to come in are the first ones to denounce you for everything you're doing wrong once you get there. We have gotten into this trap too often. And I can just imagine some people like the Chinese just laughing. Why are they doing this? We would never send troops and uh, aircraft carriers into the Persian Gulf. Let the Americans do it. I think we should realize that this actually, over the long run, attracts trouble for us. The reason I think we haven't been able to accept this fact is, is the one word that I just used, which is long run. Really, when you use that phrase, you're finished in Washington. Long run doesn't work in Washington. We, we're very short-term oriented. And uh, it, it, it's, that's the reason why we can't stop and think, for example, could we be an ally or a partner with Iran? What? Look at Iran now. Look what it is. Are you kidding me? This is the first reaction. Yeah, but what about, let's not think about right now. The world's going to go on. Iran has been around for 25 centuries. It's going to have plenty of time. So uh, let us uh, not feel that we need to guide countries and not panic when countries fall, go into directions uh, that we find horrible. Now, if, there are, if there's a huge slaughter going on, I think it moves into a different category. But anything short of that, I think we ought to restrain ourselves um, and realize that interfering to tell countries what they're doing wrong and what they should do right actually lessens the possibility that, in the end, they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Iran is really in a position with the new government to negotiate openly with the U.S. because you've got the Ayatollahs above the president? I mean, um, well, say? first of all, I sense that the, the Ayatollah, the supreme leader, seems to be sympathetic to the negotiating process. But there are certainly powerful factions in Iran that, that oppose it. Um, is Iran free to negotiate? I think uh, that there is a consensus in the society that they would like this. There is not a consensus in all circles of power. I really see a mirror image in, in Washington and Tehran that there are powerful forces that are opposed to reconciliation. Many people are making a lot of money and, and making a lot of political capital from, from this hostility. Um, and many people are still the captives of emotion. Uh, but I sense that there is now, uh, uh, let's put it this way, a narrowing of the gap between the vocabulary and rhetoric and desires of the society and the vocabulary and rhetoric and desires of the regime. That's always an important process. And uh, again, I, I want to stress that for Iran, uh, the, the long term is something that's very real. For us, it isn't. You know, after the uh, repression of the Green Movement in 2009, I was in Iran, and um, I still remember uh, one day I stopped, it was actually at Cyrus's tomb, where uh, people, Iranian families go for picnics. And I sat down, I was invited to sit down with a, an Iranian family, very happy to see Americans. And I asked the, the father, so what do you think? It wasn't that awful what happened uh, with the repression of uh, those protests. And he said, you know, uh, we tried to do something. It didn't work. Now we want to live our lives. Uh, we don't, things are not so bad that we want to throw ourselves on the bayonets of the Revolutionary Guard. We're going to get the result we want. It's just not going to come on the timetable that we expected. And you know, they think in centuries. This is something I think we could learn from them. Uh, but I do think that uh, there is a turn in, in Iran. 
I just fear that in the United States we have a strong block that will not take yes for an answer. Uh, we are so accustomed to the paradigm of hostility and we have come to such a, a degree of associating Iran, the word Iran, with all sorts of terrible things uh, that we've become a prisoner of our, of our emotions. Uh, and this is why uh, it's politically difficult in the United States, maybe even more difficult than in Iran, to sell this. So uh, as we heard as earlier today, I think uh, we not only have the negotiating process between the U.S. and Iran, but we also have the process between Iranian leaders and their factions and between our leaders and our factions. Um, those two negotiating processes might be even more difficult than the ones between the U.S. and Iran. Yes. In general, I would like to see the United States uh, pull away from choosing uh, among regimes. Uh, I, I think there is a, a, um, a coincidence of interest be, in some areas between the U.S. and some of the Gulf states that does not exist uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States. Uh, but those states also have a problem, and that is they have to pull themselves out of the Saudi orbit. They've done that to a certain degree. How can they do that? To what degree should they do that? Um, I think these are questions that they have to resolve. And I think it's one thing that is positive is that those countries slowly begin to develop their own voice. You know, I remember when the, uh, when the causeway was built between Bahrain and uh, Saudi Arabia. You know, it's an island and they have this thing. Saudi as a gift. To allow the Bahrainis to have connections with the world, they built this beautiful bridge. And there was a joke in Bahrain. Ha, ha, that's no gift. That's what the Saudis are going to use to send the tanks over. And then it actually happened. Uh, so that produces anti-Saudi resentment, needless to say. Why should we be the ones to repeat their errors? They are actually doing our job by intervening and creating backlash. And I think they are helping to create better friends for us in the Gulf. So uh, I'd like to see the US reduce its footprint there, reduce its forces there, and open ourselves up to countries who, at any point, seem to be pursuing policies that are congruent with ours. Yes? Yeah, I'm curious um, about the influence of Iran The catalyst for that, but the influence of migrants going back and forth to, especially Germany. Going yes, to Germany, exactly. To so in Iran, what would be that thing that has made them more a society? Uh, well, I think it's Iranian history, and in the Reset book, I, I try to trace this history. And I start with the story of a guy who has been forgotten that I've tried to rescue from history. Um, it was a school teacher from Nebraska named Howard Baskerville, who showed up in, uh, in Iran in the first decade of the 20th century. He was a school teacher, and uh, he got very caught up in the uh, political struggle. So they had had a constitutional revolution, they had established a parliament, but uh, the Shah had crushed it, and with the aid of Russians who came in and literally bombed the uh, Iranian parliament, uh, the Shah staged a counter-revolution. And the last city to uh, hold out was Tabriz, where Howard Baskerville was. And he got his students to form a brigade. And the American consul there was in a panic and told him, this is not your job. You're not from here. You came here as a school teacher. And his answer was, I cannot stand by and see people fighting for democracy. Cut down. As an American, I have a duty. And uh, he, he was engaged in combat, and he was killed. So we have an American who shed his blood for the cause of Iranian democracy more than 100 years ago. Actually, I always thought that the American negotiators who come into the U.S.-Iran negotiation should have like a button with Howard Baskerville's picture on it. They could show, our friendship goes, and our promotion of democracy in Iran goes back over 100 years and is sealed with blood. They named streets after him in Iran. I mean, he was a huge hero. Go over the next uh, 
50 years and you'll see fitful progress toward democracy. Of course, Reza Shah was no friend of democracy, but after he was overthrown in the early 1950s, um, Iran established finally the constitutional government that their constitutional revolution of 1909, 1906 to 1909, had promised them. So Iran has had 100 years of progress toward democracy. And I think this is very important. I believe that parliamentary democracy can take root anywhere. But there's two qualifications. There's two criteria. Number one, people have to want it. You can't force it on them. And secondly, it takes time. Because democracy is not about an election. It's about a whole way of dealing with life's problems. What is a political party? How do you decide who to vote for? You don't vote for somebody that comes from your region or is with your uh, religious sect. You're supposed to vote for somebody whose policies you agree with, whose ideology you share. It takes a long time to get to this point. What is a parliament? How do these institutions function? Iranians have been thinking about this for 100 years. They haven't, in a way, they've had a lot of fits and starts. But in their minds, they understand exactly what is democracy. And you cannot say that about almost any Arab country. They still are in this mindset, I win, I kill you. You win, you kill me. It's, it takes a long time. And I see, I see this happening in Egypt right now. And it's happening in more radical ways in some other countries, Syria being a perfect example. Uh, so I think Iranians have had this 100 years to assimilate what democracy means. They haven't achieved it in the sense that Turks have, but they are so ready for it ideologically and politically and socially and emotionally. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. One, uh, it's a historical question. Was there a time, and maybe a brief time, when Saudi foreign policy or Saudi policy was not hypocritical when they could support the the Wahhabi regime, the, the Wahhabi leaders at home, and at the same time be supporting the Mujahideen uh, supported by the United States in Afghanistan, and therefore uh, the differences between U.S. interests and interests with regard to um, uh, their internal uh, religious dilemmas was less. Uh, let me just comment on that before you get to your other That's one. I'm right. I'm just asking this. Yeah. I have a second? Okay. I think... Uh, this is actually a really interesting question because the Afghanistan situation shows a real shows the essence of the U.S. Saudi tie. Why we were so friendly with them. So we needed billions of dollars to support the mujahideen in over a ten-year period in uh, Afghanistan. Where are we going to get the money? So uh, we we went to the Saudis, and the Saudis agreed we'll match you dollar for dollar. They gave us billions. They have a check. They have an, a blank check for us. But this, they, they seduced us with that. It seemed so easy. And with that, they thought they could buy our friendship and support. And they were right. But in the long run, this was just a way to maintain a relationship which was positive for them, but toxic for us. A quick question on Iran. I thought it was fascinating what you said. Much of the criticism directed at the United States um, with regard to the invasion of Iraq is that we uh, destroy uh, the opposition to, to Iran. In other words, we, just, we, <laughs> we destroy the potential ally. Would the policies you're suggesting, I'm not even sure how this would work out, um, uh, somehow uh, uh, be a corrective to uh, uh, creating a situation which we created in Iraq because we would be closer to Iran. I'm not quite sure how this all... You're, it's a very interesting point. The Iraqi part of it. This is the part of a standard critique of the United States. Why did you go after Iraq? So would this be a corrective to this in some way? Well, the, the Saudi king actually told uh, an, one, a senior American official who came to tell him about our plan to invade Iraq. He, they, they didn't like the idea. And the, the king said, "You talking about Iraq, he said, you are handing that country over to Iran on a plate. Yeah. And he was so right. We gave Iran the greatest strategic victory in its modern history because we got rid of both of their major enemies, Saddam and the Taliban, for free. So we brought Iran to a position of much greater geopolitical self-confidence. Uh, we helped, we helped bring Iran back to the 
place where it should be. But we didn't want to do that because Iran was our number one enemy. And here is this odd situation. Our number one enemy got the greatest gift of its modern history from us. Um, Because, because uh, we got attacked from uh, Afghanistan, and uh, what, what was it, Rumsfeld's idea? There, were, there was not a target-rich environment in Afghanistan, so we decided to attack Iraq. It was that famous line, uh, to attack Iraq after having been attacked from Afghanistan would be like attacking Mexico after Pearl Harbor, and we were bombed by Japan. There, there wasn't a reason to do that, except that we had this idea, it's going to be the beginning of a cascade. We're going to totally transform the Middle East. But the end result is, what you just said, not, not just the Saudi king, but a third grade history teacher could have told the Bush administration that that would happen. And but they only got to the second grade. <laughs> I'm, I'm really no, you, I agree with you, but we didn't get it. You know, I'll tell you why. I think, I think what, really what our answer to that was is, no, we're not handing it over to Iran because as soon as we finish in one, in one month stabilizing Iraq, we're going after Iran. And, and the, Iran is going to be changed also. So you don't have to worry about giving Iran a favor. By next year, Iran is going to have a pro-American regime. I think that was their answer. But, Richard Clark. Yeah, Richard Clark, exactly. So let, let, me, let me finish answering your question. Um, now we are dealing with a situation where Iran is empowered, thanks to us. But we have, we, there's a change in Iran now. When we did that, um, Iran uh, was still in a position where it wasn't ready to negotiate with us. It is now. Iran now has, we're now in, a, in an interesting sort of co combination, the stars are aligned. Uh, Iran rising to its natural position of influence in the Middle East is now not necessarily bad for us the way it used to be, but it, is, it could be bad for Saudi Arabia. And this is why I say we should not subcontract our foreign policy out. Iran has changed, so let's take advantage of that and let's not be caught by our, in, in the vice of our stereotypes formed in another era. Okay, one more, and then we'll, we'll end it. Thank you. So you just mentioned that, um, that there's a categorical difference between what happens inside of the states and with these growing pains, the difficulties that states grow in, and a category of sort of mass slaughter. I mean, genocide would fit into that. I'm wondering how you see Syria, which side of the coin that fits into, and where the U.S. long-term interests fit vis-a-vis -vis Syria. Well, first of all, I'm... I'm overwhelmed by the tragedy in Syria. I still can't wrap my mind around it that this is happening in Syria. I, I really, I'm, I'm almost speechless. Like even when I see the pictures, I still can't assimilate that this is going on. It's it's so awful, and uh, just seems uh, so self-destructive. That is a country that has now torn itself apart. It's almost impossible to see how it can ever be rebuilt. Um, so I oppose the idea of American military intervention in Syria. Uh, but I would like to see us much more vigorously involved in trying to seek a diplomatic solution. Not only are we opposed to having Iran at the table, which is obstructing a, a diplomatic solution, but our, our, our stated policy is that negotiations must begin with the acceptance of the principle that Assad cannot stay in power. He's got to go. Now, that's something that has to come out of negotiations. You can't start negotiations with that kind of a demand. So uh, I'd like to see us accept the fact that we can't have everything we want because the situation in Syria is so urgent. We should be concentrating intense diplomacy uh, in Syria. And I would even raise the possibility of, of a partition of Syria. Um, I think that country never made sense the way it was drawn by French and British diplomats uh, almost 100 years ago in the wake of World War I. Um, it was carved up as a kind of a gift to the French because uh, the British had the rest of the Middle East. Um, so maybe history can return to Syria, and Syria can be divided either into new nations or into uh, autonomous regions uh, as, as nature and the facts on the ground dictate. I don't, that's, I think, one interesting, intriguing solution. I don't, I don't have the final solution, but I, I find it awful 
that you'd have this combination. At the same time, you have this unbelievable, horrific conflict tearing Syria apart. And on the other hand, there doesn't really seem to be much going on to, to try to resolve it in a peaceful way. You have Russia interested. You have Iran interested. The United States says it's interested, although frankly, I think the United States has concluded that the best thing for us is just to let them keep fighting, let it be unstable, which I find unconscionable. And I don't think that is in our interest, actually, over the long run. Uh, so in this case, I favor intervention, but diplomatic intervention. We should be making a full court press on, on trying to find a diplomatic solution to Syria. And every day that goes by when poor, the poor UN negotiator is walking around trying to get people to sit down, more people are dying in Syria. And I, I find it awful that uh, the United States doesn't really seem to have a plan B. You know, when we decide not to bomb, that sort of leads us to think, OK, well, I guess we're not involved then. We're not going to bomb, so that means we're not doing anything. This is a terrible approach for the United States. And this is not intervention. Uh, this is what I'd like to do with Iran, an intensive negotiation. Let's get to know each other. Let's find out. Let's keep all the options on the table in a positive way. Let's open up these dialogues for all kinds of possibilities. And let's not come in with conditions. Uh, so for Syria, I think it's a hugely urgent situation. And uh, it is in the U.S. interest to stop that slaughter. You know, there, uh, I, when I say America should act in its own interests, it is in the interest of the United States to be a leader in fighting against uh, huge humanitarian catastrophes like, like that. Uh, because if you want to be very crude about it, that's part of our standing in the world. We have to be a country that stands up for some standard of human decency. But enforcing those standards by military means is not going to work. Does it? But that shouldn't be the end of the story. So there has to be a plan B. And we've never been in this mindset. It's traditional for the United States. Either if you're not our friend, if you're our enemy, either we're going to bomb you and invade you and occupy you, or we're not doing anything. There's got to be something in between. And I think Syria is the ideal place to find that. OK, thank you very much. And thank you, Danny. Folks, um, if you found this evening's talk by Stephen interesting and thought-provoking and would like to pursue some of his ideas further, his two most recent books are here for sale, The Brothers and Reset, which has a new afterword. The paperback edition uh, has a new afterword. And if you're interested in what Stephen was just saying about Syria, thanks to Ben's excellent question, um, uh, the Syria Dilemma is also here. Um, and uh, in as incredible as it is to think that Stephen uh, actually gave two talks here today at uh, DU, he's now off to Tattered Cover Books, Tattered Cover uh, down on uh, Colfax to give yet a third talk. Um, so if you're interested and want to follow him over there, maybe maybe you can get uh, a lift in the taxi that's going to be taking him over there, um, a caravan. But uh, I really want to, um, on behalf of the Center for Middle East Studies and the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, I want to thank Stephen Kinzer for his time and a seemingly indefatigable energy here this, uh, this afternoon. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you all.